It's to be present enough, to be aware enough, to start to hear those voices, to be aware of what's going on and see which one you follow. Which of those are you listening to? And then as you get more aware, you start to see the suitability. Is that the most skillful voice? Is that the voice that, that I might best follow? But you can't know that until you become aware of what you are feeling and what's going on. Hello, and welcome back to Jack Kornfield's Heart Wisdom Podcast, nestled in its home here on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network. I'm Ganesh, Jack's assistant, welcoming you to a special New Year's episode, Awareness of Feelings, Mindfulness of Food. This took place at Spirit Rock on New Year's Day of 1988, and goes into some pretty pivotal things that come up in our lives around holiday times, at least for me. I definitely found myself, when I was with my family, caught up in a lot of my feelings. I was feeling trapped in a lot of different situations, and I called Jack up, and I explained to him what I had going on and why I was in such a kerfluffle. And one of the things he said to me was that conditions change very quickly. And one of the main things in this podcast when he was talking about awareness of feelings is that if you become aware of your feelings, they don't actually last that long. If we consistently lament over them and revivify the story, yeah, they're gonna keep popping back up. But what he states here is that if you mindfully become aware and note the feeling, you'll notice it goes away pretty quickly. Impermanence in this sense is on our side. Also tying into the holidays, one could say that food is an issue, or more so our relationship with food. I find myself when I go home to see family thrown back into old cycles. It's like all of a sudden there's all these like cookies from grandma around and it's chips and uh, pies and I'm trying to dissociate from things. And uh, yeah, I'm sure this is a familiar thing for a lot of people listening as well. And especially with New Year's here, uh, people want to get into healthier habits. So, so listening to Jack's bit here on mindfulness of food and hunger and the spiritual perspective on eating and diet was a really helpful thing for me to reset and start this new year off proper. And I hope it gives you the same opportunity. So as I move from grandma's Christmas cookie tin and down on to the yoga mat, I have a bit of housekeeping just to share what Jack has going on coming up. On February 19th marks his Spirit Rock Monday Night Dharma Talk and Guided Meditation, which he does monthly. This is Pay What You Can, and we highly recommend you come and join us in spiritual community. This is online, and you can go to jackcornfield.com Dot com and go under events in order to sign up. And if you're looking to steep in even more spiritual community, we have Cloud Sangha. This is Jack and Tara Brock's brainchild for digital spiritual community and the new age. If you would like to check out what Cloud Sangha has coming up and different groups that you can join, go to cloudsangha.co. And then finally, as always, Jack has an array of amazing courses online. You can go to jackcornfield.com and click on courses and check out the various offerings he has there. And I highly implore you to check out our newsletter. You can go to jackcornfield.com slash newsletter. This is where we will send the updates for our various courses Jack has going on, as well as different free offerings, which we like to give out as much as possible. So this is it, episode 220, Awareness of Feelings, Mindfulness of Food like to thank you for being here as always. May you be happy and healthy. May you help others through the authenticity of your own being. And may your heart always be smiling. Namaste. So again this evening, I would like to continue to talk about 
meditation practice, the last couple of weeks, the topic has been several of the states which can arise spontaneously or be cultivated in practice through attention and care uh, with one's mind and one's heart, loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy. Just talking about how we can learn about those states and equanimity. This week, I want to shift more to talking directly about the practice of awareness and paying attention rather than the cultivation of states, the understanding of the states of heart and mind. If you know the poetry of T.S. Eliot, probably his most well-known lines from the last portion of his quartets, where he says, We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Most everyone has heard those lines. And it goes on and it's a wonderful poem and and a series of poems and worth rereading. In a way, the practice of mindfulness or awareness in sitting practice or in our daily life is just that straightforward and simple. It's to come back to where we are, to to live in the reality of the present and to know what is here, sometimes for the first time. Last week, I also talked a bit about debt. If you recall, I mentioned a client who had come and done a a, a ceremony for their mother and uh, was given the ashes and the, the kind of struggle that they had holding this bag of ashes and thinking of their mother at the same time and trying to come to terms with the brevity of life and with the inevitability of change and of death. When we remember that things change, when we can see it in front of us from a moment to another moment to a day, it affects deeply the way that we live. If we know that things are really fleeting, it brings a quality or a care to to our attention to know where we are, because we realize that this may be the only time, in fact, it is the only time that we'll be in this day, in this moment, in this circumstance. So one tends to live less automatically if we remember the fact of change and of impermanence and of death. Now, there's a particular quality in the teachings of the Buddha that's often linked with mindfulness or awareness as one phrase. The word in Sanskrit or Pali for awareness is sati. And the word that goes with it is sampajanya. It's often said sati sampajanya. And the word sampajanya is translated as clear comprehension or clear seeing. And it has several meanings. And the reason that it's linked with attention, you'll you'll understand as I speak of it. It means to be aware of what's here and to see it for what it is, to see the context within which this moment is happening. That context or clear comprehension has has three different aspects. The first is the ethical context, or to put it another way, the integrity with which we are living in this particular moment. Not just to be aware of what's present, but in that awareness to have a sense of our being and our body and our heart and our actions and sense whether we are living with integrity. That is whether we are living what we know, whether we are living and acting what we value. That's the first part of clear comprehension. And there is a strange and wonderful kind of beauty and strength that comes 
even in difficulty, even in doing terribly hard things, if it is connected with our integrity. Do you know what I mean? Even when things are very difficult, if that quality of clear comprehension that we know this is connected with our deeper values, we can do very, very difficult things, and it's fine. Now, one of the contexts that I'll use to explain it tonight will be the eating meditation. Those of you who have done classes or retreats or had instruction in the practice know the old chewing the raisins in the way that we teach eating meditation. How many people have not gone through the eating meditation instruction, just to know? Aha. Uh -huh. They'll have to come to either beginning class. I brought raisins, but I don't think I'll do it tonight. I think I'll do a... I'll do a whole thing another night on eating. Not just the instructions, but a whole elaboration. But we'll, we'll use it as an example. There is a meditation that we teach as part of every retreat and every series of classes of becoming mindful of eating. And I'll use it as an example tonight in explaining clear comprehension. Now, in an ethical basis, it's not so much how you eat. As, as one of my teachers said, it's not what goes in the mouth that matters so much, but what comes out of it. <laughs> so it's not getting some food trip, so to say, or some perfection of how one should eat, but rather looking at our actions, as I said, whether they're speaking or relating to other people or our livelihood or whatever part of our life, and listening with our awareness to see if those actions are in line with our integrity. In terms of eating, there might be a few ethical principles for people to not harm other beings so that depending on your sensibility or your sensitivity, it can be arranged. For some people, it means not eating certain kinds of tuna fish because they kill dolphins or not eating table grapes because there's a strike of uh, farm workers due to the level of pesticide poisoning for hundreds and thousands of people who pick food, but also, guess who else? All the people who eat the products that are made with added. So it's not just for us, but a, in some way a caring for other people, at least to pay attention to that. Or factory farming and the ways that chickens and eggs and all kinds of things are raised often now in this country. And I don't mean to go on a whole elaborate thing about food and say what you should eat or what you shouldn't. My diet is nothing much to speak of. Um, and I, I have probably as many hamburgers as I have anything else, at least at some times. Um, but I don't eat fast food hamburgers much anymore after... <laughs> Not only after several stomach aches, but also after reading about uh, rainforests and what ha and the the cultivation of cattle in Central and South America by cutting down rainforests to provide food. I mean, beef for McDonald's at ten cents a pound low or whatever. The point of it is that the first aspect of clear seeing and awareness is seeing whether our actions, whether it's eating or speaking or driving or our livelihood or our family work, is in line with our higher values, in line with what, what we really care about, especially when we remember our death and we remember that it's a short dance. In a sense, it's attention to whether our actions are harming other beings or not. And when you become aware of it, it gets much harder to do. We can only do it when we're not really aware of the pain it causes. Now, the second aspect of clear comprehension is called suitability. And that focuses more on attention to oneself rather than attention to whether we're harming others. So in terms of diet again, it might be what our body needs, what kind of diet is fitting for us, the, the amount of exercise we get, the climate we live in, taking care with this vehicle or this vessel, if you will, that we are given 
to live and share and awaken in, in our life. So this isn't so much ethicality, but it's, it's a sensitivity to, our, to ourselves and our life. When we were monks, every day we would go out and collect food in our alms bowl. And there was a series of reflections we would do before eating each time. Part of those reflections were of gratitude. Gratitude for receiving food, gratitude for having that to eat which other people who are hungry don't. It was an amazing experience, and I've talked about it at other sittings, to be able to go out with a bowl in the morning and to be given food in, in a country where it's not really begging because monks and nuns are really deeply revered and people will wait in the villages. Sometimes they'll wait on their knees with their hands together like uh, they were praying and they'll offer the best of the food they have. Um, and it's an extraordinary thing to go barefoot just as the sun is coming up and walk a few miles across rice paddies because most of the monasteries are out in the rural areas. And then go to some village, it's, it's like turning the clock back 2,000 years um, and walk through a village street barefoot and have people wait and offer you rice or curry or whatever they have. And you learn not to be too picky about your food. Someday it's water chestnuts and, and uh, fish curry and someday it's water buffalo stew because that's what they have. And someday it's beautiful vegetarian cooking. And someday it's mostly rice and uh, not much else. And you learn a lot just going through that process. But part of what's wonderful about it is that it puts you in a relationship of, of tremendous gratitude. And part of the reflection, as I said, is, is of gratitude for receiving it. But the other part of the reflection is what is its purpose? Why do we bother asking food of other people or eating. And the reflection that's done is we nourish ourselves in order to give sustenance so that we can grow in wisdom and compassion so that our heart can be nourished. We nourish the body so that we can then nourish the spirit. In, it, in a sense, it's not living to eat, but eating to live and to live in the deepest sense of living our values. So clear comprehension, first part is being aware of whether it's harming other people or integrity. The second is being aware of its suitability for ourselves, being aware of the action that we take, whether it's food or speaking or how we drive or what we drive or what we do for work or all kinds of aspects of our life, where we live, how we take care of the, the surroundings of our house or our community, how that affects us, and what kind of life that's shaping. Now, the third part of Sampajanya, and the most, uh, the part that's most connected with the silent inner meditation of sitting practice is the comprehension or the seeing of the process of experience. When you become aware in a moment, you're aware of a sound or a sight or a certain feelings that arise or a thought, you recognize what's there. That's what awareness means, to see what's here. To see it clearly also is to recognize its nature. And if you look at your feelings or your thoughts or your ideas or your opinions or your physical sensations or sounds or whatever experience it is, and you see what it is and observe it for a little while, you also see that it changes. So to see it clearly is to know what's present, but also to begin to feel its rhythm, its movement, its change, the fact of its impermanence and through that to get a sense of the changing flow of all of our life. Now, this is really important when one wants to 
learn about the nature of mind and feeling. See if I can find, there's a quote here from the Buddha in this current inquiring mind. About to apply it in here. What, yeah? This is the Buddha saying, how does one contemplate the nature of mind? Herein, a Malkar nun sits down and pays attention and knows the fearful mind is fearful. The mind that's grasping is the grasping mind. The mind that's free of fear as a mind free of fear. Or the heart that's free of grasping as a heart free of grasping. The mind filled with hatred as hating. The mind or heart free of hatred as free of hatred. The mind deluded or lost as deluded. The heart free of delusion as undeluded. The heart or mind is contracted or open. This is from the Sutra on the Development of Mindfulness. So what practice is about is beginning to see what is here to know it, to know when it's contracted, to know when it's open, to know when there's fear, to know when there's peace, to begin to know what our experience is and to observe and learn the laws which govern it or its process. Now, being aware, when you do the eating meditation, we, when we pass the raisins around, you start to see in a very simple way this process. For example, we'll give people raisins and say, all right, now, before you eat, become aware of what you feel. And if they're hungry, they'll sit and look at them, and you'll notice the arising of hunger. And most people have never really paid attention to hunger. It drives much of humanity, much of our own lives, desire, wanting, hunger. And yet we spend our time trying to fill ourselves or fulfill it, but rarely do we stop and say, what does hunger feel like? What's it like in the belly? What's it like in the body? What's it like as a state of the mind or the heart? So this first part of eating meditation is just to sit there and not eat at all and see what it's like to become aware of hunger and make some peace with it, come to some understanding of it. Then people start to eat, chew the raisins generally. After just one mouthful, I'll ask for people's comments. And inevitably, someone will raise their hand and say, those were amazing, those raisins. They were so full of flavor. What did you put in them? You know? We put a little LSD in the raisins or something. It makes them really. And what it is, is that for that moment, with their eyes closed, really paying attention, they were here. What makes the raisins so fantastic is that there was somebody here to taste them. And we could go out to one of the hundred or thousand gourmet restaurants of Marin County, you know, now there's cuisine from everywhere, Vietnamese Cajun cuisine and <laughs> northern Greek Chinese specialty shops and all these amazing things. And you go and you have a wonderful meal and you're busy talking with somebody and thinking about stuff and whatever. In the end, you're still hungry because you really didn't taste it. So the first part of it is just to be present. Then inevitably what happens is people are doing the eating meditation. They'll chew the raisins or pay attention. and There'll be this big burst of flavor. And then if you look yourself, if you haven't done it, you'll find this out. After you chew things for a little while, the flavor tends to fade. But then you still have to chew them to get it ready to swallow. There's a long period like a cow of kind of chewing your cud. And then you swallow and if I watch, and I like to watch sometimes when people are meditating, that's my job, right? And um, I'll see people chewing a little bit, and then their hand will reach down and put more raisins in, like this. And it's clear they haven't even finished the first bite. And what happens often is you chew and you get a nice burst of flavor, and then you chew it a little more and the flavor's gone. You haven't swallowed yet. And automatically the hand reaches out and stuffs some more in there 
So you get another burst of flavor. It's to get the pleasure to last as much as you can. Have you ever recognized that in your life? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's in one bite, you can get the whole of Buddhist psychology. You see that the pleasant states are rising and then the desire and the attachment are wanting more and the trying to sustain it by stuffing more raisins in and so forth. You also see the whole process of change, if you look closely, how the raisins, which are certain, the, the basic elements of hardness or softness or heat or temperature, as you chew them, the whole physical world changes about them. Then at the end of that process, I'll ask people to pay attention when they go and do the eating meditation in a meal to the end of the meal. You could do this at home this week, even if you've never done eating meditation. When you finish chewing and tasting and having your meal, then listen to the different voices which arise and tell you when to stop eating. There'll be a half dozen of them. Your belly will often speak first and say, had enough, that's just fine, comfortable. Then your tongue might say, uh-uh, that stuff there's really good, let's have a little more of that. And your eyes will say, yeah, we haven't even tried that over there. And then maybe some voice in your mind will say, um, you shouldn't eat too much, you know. And then your mother will come along and she'll say, you should finish everything on your plate. And you'll hear your stomach and your tongue and your eyes and your opinions about your weight and your mother and probably a couple of other voices as well. And what becomes important in that practice of awareness is not to say which voice to listen to. You should always follow your mother or your belly or your tongue or whatever. If you follow any of those completely, you'll get in trouble. But rather, it's to be present enough, to be aware enough, to start to hear those voices, to be aware of what's going on and see which one you follow. Which of those are you listening to? And then as you get more aware, you start to see the suitability. Is that the most skillful voice? Is that the voice that, that I might best follow? But you can't know that until you become aware of what you are feeling and what's going on. A lot of the therapy work that I do, my therapy practice involves working with people generally who have a spiritual practice already, but they come in in their areas that their meditation, whether it's Zen or Sufi or Vipassana or whatever, hasn't helped them with so much. And so they, they're looking for some other ways to become aware. And a good part of that therapy practice has to do with becoming aware of their feelings, becoming aware of what's going on and what are those voices inside, whether it's their mother or their stomach or their judgment, judging mind or, or their eyes or some opinion that they've heard and what they feel about things. To become aware of feelings in meditation is really central. And one can do that through the process that we work with in this practice of giving a name or a label to things. You can sit and there arises sadness. You note sad, sad, or there arises happiness. And you note happy, happy, or peaceful, or angry. You begin to recognize the states of the heart and mind. It's the same word in Sanskrit, as they arise. And when you do that, it becomes possible to live in a very different way. Now, one thing to say about this, which I've mentioned at many retreats, is that if you become aware of your feelings, they don't last very long. We feel like we're angry for a day or sad for a week or happy for a, uh, for a month or a certain period or grieving for a while as if those feelings lasted that long. But if you look closely and you let yourself feel what's here and pay attention, feelings rarely last more than 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and then they turn into something else, sometimes just five or 10 seconds, guaranteed. 
If you have some feeling that feels like it's lasted a much longer than that, you haven't paid attention to it. One thing that's helpful in doing that is to be able to track your feelings, which is to say, to be aware of what's present, that's the awareness part, and to know its beginning and its end. And to track it means just to pay attention until you notice that it's turned into some other feeling, which is to give it a, one good way is to give it a label and see if it lasts five or 10 or 15 labels long. And if you really feel it and pay attention, it will turn into something else because the very practice of paying attention allows things to open. It's a process. Attention is a process of opening. Now, there's a lot that we don't want to feel, that we're unable to or our habit is that we avoid or that's scary or that's difficult. And there's hunger and loss and grief and shame and guilt and sorrow and self-judgment and anger and fear. For some people, the pleasant ones are scary. Pleasure is hard to feel or delight or being in love. That's scary for certain people. There's a whole part of a range of our being that we're not so aware of. And yet they're very important. Without becoming aware of them, we can't live in a wise way. I've been reading it, some of these talks, some excerpts from this book called The Wall, which is letters and offerings and images that were left at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington. And it's a very powerful and moving book. The memorial has become a place where people leave things and they go to cry and grieve and come to terms with a very difficult and for many of them terrible aspect of their life, people who've lost loved ones and family members and friends. But it's also become a place in some way of hope for people because it's become a place that they can come to terms with what they feel. On the back is this picture of a man carrying the sign and wearing some old green fatigues that says, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I like the memorial. <clears throat> and if it makes it difficult to send people into battle again, I'll like it even more. <clears throat> but I want to read you two things from this, if I may. These are letters that are left by people who go there, or notes, or, or packages, or medals that are put on there and saying, this medal isn't for me, but it's for you who died. You and I were not friends while you were alive. We weren't very close anyway, but then we were only kids. Still, I came today to honor your sacrifice. I came for Kathy and for your parents and also for the man you would have grown to be, a man I would have liked. The kid I remember probably wouldn't have cared much for these flowers from my garden, but the man you could have been would appreciate them. The Indian blanket and purple sage are native to Texas, and there are sprigs of thyme, melissa, and fennel native to your father's homeland. I hope you like them as much as I do. It's a place where people can feel their feelings and start to relate to what is true for that. I'll read you one more that in some ways is more difficult. <clears throat> it's that time of year again for me to say my special hello. I feel so close to you when I am back here at the wall. What I see, feel, and touch your name on this black granite panel. Line 57, 23 West. I feel such pride for having known you for so many years. Many times I ask myself why you died and left me behind. I don't know, but I will always have the good memories, like the homecoming dance 
when you fell on your behind trying to impress me with what a good dancer you were. Remember they called you, me, and Jerry Lynn the three musketeers because when you saw one, you saw all three of us. Well, Jerry's name is down on panel 22 East, line 46. You two always did stick together, but you guys left me out this time. I know you're not lonely in heaven. You have Jerry and 58,476 other brothers and sisters whose names are on the wall with you. Remember till next year, I love you and I miss you. To live a life of awareness asks a lot of us. And it asks that we know ourselves and know our feelings and know our hearts. (laughs) 